All right, everybody, what's up? We've got Jimmy here on the mic, and we have Mark, as usual, and frequent guest Paul Neese here. Yes, indeed. Now, Mark, you've kind of gotten thrown into this family vortex mix with uh, Sam and Dave, both international men of mystery, if yes. you will. Now, there is another one, and it's Joe, <laughs> and he's on the podcast now. So this is this is Joe Hamilton, and... Uh, we were kind of giving him crap because actually if you really knew all of them, you would probably assume that Joe would have been the first to be a guest on the podcast. <laughs> and uh, probably even I wouldn't be the host of the podcast. You'd assume Joe would be the host. This is true. Exactly. Perhaps right? the most grega- gregarious has been the most <laughs> mysterious thus far. But you know what? Maybe we've been wrong about the International Men of Mystery all along and it's just been him. I'm with you. I think you're right. Here I am. First words on the podcast. Uh, There he is. The good news, Jim, we've got him now. He is in the hot seat. True, true. And this is a good hot seat to be in today because we're going to be talking about some stuff that a lot of people have asked us about in the past. You know, we've been putting out a number of podcasts on, you know, maybe it's semi-live, how to do something or some information on, you know, a product or uh, an activity or just talking about hunting, shooting, etc. Uh, but a lot of people want to know, kind of uh, peeling back the curtain of some of the stuff that's happened at Vortex. Now we got here today and figured no better person to bring on than Joe in combination with Paul, mm-hmm. because both of these guys combined have been here for a long time. If you, Like I said, if you combine that. <laughs> I cannot emphasize how, a positive, right? how <laughs> long <laughs> Joe has been here. Um, no, that was... You uh, can't wait for him to get out of here. That was a <laughs> Freudian slip. But um, anyway, no, but, you know, pretty much, I mean, Joe since the beginning and Paul very shortly after came along and they've seen a lot of things go on. So we're going to talk a little bit maybe about some of where the where the brand started because I think people who are very familiar with the brand now, Vortex, if you saw kind of what it was like back in 2002, you'd be scratching your head a little bit, which Amazing. is which is just Difference. fine. Yep. And we also have, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this smattering of products across the table. And some of these are are, are what we call hits, if you will. And some of these are what we call uh, misses, to put it lightly. So anyway, uh, that's a lot of talking on my part here. We're going to have to let Joe introduce himself, though. I've, I, uh, I, I've, I don't want to give him too much crap today. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Joe, why don't you take it away and uh, and let the listeners know who you are, kind of what you've done here and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. So not giving me too much crap. So that would be a first, everybody. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so my name's Joe Hamilton. So um, and uh, you know, my title here is Chief uh, Sales and Marketing Officer. But I've, I've been here um, kind of since the start, uh, along with, with Paul. And, um, so I, I lead a lot of, uh, leaders, um, around the company that, um, sales marketing focused and, and IT and other areas like that. So, um, yeah, kind of have a good, uh, good overall history of what, uh, what Vortex has been through and, and from the start to the middle to not the finish, but where we're at now. And, uh, yeah, excited to be here. No, we were talking about this a little bit last night as, as Joe was preparing to be on his first podcast with us here. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that some people, like we've talked with Sam and Dave, we've talked with other people who, you know, engineers and product development and things like that. And I think that a lot of times then when you hear, you know, that somebody's in sales, they kind of can be a little cynical, right? Because right. they think, okay, you have these engineers and these product development guys, and they're, they're the ones who really care about, you know, making this amazing product and and doing whatever it you know it takes to come up with these new technology and stuff. And then oh, those sales guys, all they ever want to do is just just sell you stuff. You don't yeah, need some, some poor schlep who's trying to sell you something. <laughs> Used yeah. car salesman, yeah, yeah. By the yeah. way, Joe, I don't need those encyclopedias. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't, you don't need them now. You don't need them now. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah yeah uh no means not yet <laughs> <laughs> oh man but you know it's it's funny because we were talking a little bit about how i think a lot of times people just you know they don't quite it, it doesn't quite hit them that you know in in order for product development people and things like that to to develop new products and to make new products and for consumers to wind up getting cool new technologies out there and things like that you know, business needs to survive, 
essentially, right? And you gotta you gotta innovate and and part of really I think you'll find too this is gonna almost be in some ways kind of like a quasi biz marketing podcast because we're gonna talk a little bit how NPD new product development and sales really do cross over quite a bit and and many times actually sales can help NPD out quite a lot oh, right? absolutely. and yeah. uh, and maybe times we don't need to get into these. Maybe at, at times prevent them from doing uh, something too engineery. <laughs> we've had to save we've, engineers from themselves at we've times. We've done a few of those. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I uh, just felt like felt like bring that up. But Joe, what's some of the stuff that you've done here? What uh, what to give people an idea of how far back this goes? Hmm. Yeah. What what would you tell somebody if they were like, what was it like when you first started here at Vortex? Yeah, so it was very different. So we were a lot smaller. We had we had less people. Um, we were in a we were in a different facility, and um, and everybody wore a million different hats. So not quite as many hats to wear now. But one of the big differences is when Vortex started in two thousand two. It really looked nothing like it does now. In fact, we had several different brands of products that we that we were selling. Um, and, um, in fact, some of them are pictured here. Um, but we, some of them were licenses like the National Audubon Society line of binoculars. Um, we had these collegiate licensed sportoculars, which we thought, uh, <laughs> all of, uh, all of our kids, uh, were going to go to college on, on the, uh, uh, what we would do with the sportoculars. And, um, and we had, we had the masterpiece opera glass collection. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but we had, <laughs> oh, we're going to talk so more we, about we, these. Had, we had quite a few stuff, uh, different, different products there. And like I said, one of them was Vortex. So you can see there, um, you know, everybody has to start from somewhere. And so we started so from pretty, pretty humble beginnings. Um, but one of the things we did have some constants that, that, that we did. And so, um, one of those is we wanted to make sure whatever product we, we did, no matter what kind of a market it had, that it was really a good product for the price, and it gave a really good performance um, to the customer. Um, so in some cases, it was great performance for a very small, selective amount of customers, <laughs> and uh, and in other cases, it was it gave great performance to a, a much larger demographic. But that was that was pretty consistent. Um, one of the other unique things um, that happened sort of at the beginning was we, we tried a lot of different things. We were, we, were, we were passionate about really high quality products. We were passionate about optics, but, um, but also we were starting something and we didn't really know what the different markets were. So we had a lot of different demographics that we started with. And that was really, um, you know, kind of looked a little bit like a shotgun approach at first, but actually it ended up being really um, positive for us because we actually saw a lot of what the customers wanted and didn't want. And so we could sort of um, move and change really quickly and adapt. And that's kind of what we did. And so the first kind of three years, we had a lot of these different lines, Vortex being one. And that really gave us the experience of what customers wanted. And so you combine that with um, our, our employee base starting to become much more hunting and shooting focused. I mean, particularly with Paul and Sam and some others, they were really focused on those markets. And we started to add new people that were also big hunters and shooters. And so when you kind of combine that with learning um, what, customers, uh, what customers wanted, then in around 2005, that's really where we got rid of a lot of the licenses, got rid of a lot of the other stuff that, you, that you'll see here, the Sportoculars, the Opera Glass Collection, and we went full on behind Vortex. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's where Sam came up with the new logo and kind of a new look of the products. We were able to t use some of the exact same products and redo them in, in sort of the Vortex format. But, you know, more as you see it and it looks now... Uh, for Vortex, it started in about 2005. Right. The old logo was like the old hurricane symbol, right? So, like when you're watching yeah. the news around hurricane season, you see that big red spiraling. The twi the twister. Yeah, right here. Twister. I don't know. If, I don't know where the cameras yeah. are, but the twister, that little, yeah, it was looked like uh, looked like a hurricane or t or a typhoon or a twister. I mean, yeah. they were. This was called the twister, and the other one was called the typhoon. Um, and so, yeah, very very different different logo. Yeah, and the you know the big thing around. 2005 must have been too. Is that that's when the rifle scopes yeah. got rolled into it, and of course, as we know now, they yes. became the dominant products that we yeah. That yeah. we sell. What was it? What was it like? Because I know when we first started out, really a lot of what we were familiar with was the pretty much bird watching and observation market. In fact, I have I have two up here on my uh, on my phone, which is amazing that it even works on mobile. This archived old Vortex website. And the um, banner image, if you will, this wasn't this created by Dave. 
My I, brother somebody Dave. somebody internally took the photo, but he did create the first website. He had this JavaScript book that was about six inches tall. And, it's uh, uh, yeah. it looks like a old website for the Pittsburgh Steelers because it's all black <laughs> and yellow. And um, <laughs> if the uh, thing picked it up, none of the images work anymore on your phone. But this image, I do know when I f- I did look it up at one point, it's like a guy sitting on a rock looking at a tree or something. Yeah, it like looks that. very. Uh, I mean, it looks it, very much like an REI type of a, or brand that you'd find yeah, like, in like an REI. Yeah, like rock climbers kind of. Yep. You know what what some people would call granola. Not that there's anything wrong with. Well, that. I'm surprised Dave would have uh, chosen an image like that. <laughs> oh, right, I know. Yeah, Dave, Mr. Mountain Man. Yep. Um, but yeah, no. So what was what was it like at first when? We started seeing, you know, like a guy like Paul come in, who was this Idaho guide for many years and using optics and things like that and, and start talking about rifle scopes. What what was that like? How'd that conversation go? Are those, I, mean, I can only imagine many conversations. Well, so Paul had been with us, you know, for for a long time, even, mm-hmm. even uh, from a professional standpoint. Uh, before me, obviously we were around uh, forever, but from a professional standpoint, he had been there and he had big, been a big hunter and um, really kind of been a catalyst, you know, Hey, let's look into the doing the rifle scopes. Let's, let's consider the rifle scopes. And you're right for a lot of, a lot of f- folks internally, it was a, it was a foreign category. And so I think, you know, kind of a combination of Paul um, just being a catalyst behind the rifle scopes, and then you know folks like Sam really getting into to hunting and shooting, and then and then getting some more people on there that were sort of catalysts to just really l- inform people about hunting and shooting, and and then all, all of a sudden getting us excited about it. Um, and then a, in a lot of cases, what was happening is we were selling uh, binoculars to um, to hunting stores, and so it was it was it was sort of this nice yin and yang between uh, a lot of those stores asking for that. And then internally the growing, um, excitement, uh, for those products, um, and, and growing influence, um, that really sort of led to us kind of yeah, getting into that. Yeah. You know, and you probably remember, Joe, we had a couple of guys early in the company's history, no longer here, but that were very big in archery hunting. Yes. And so we got kind of a foothold in yep. the, in the archery world too, which, yep. you know, of course, a lot of the archers crossed over into yes. rifle hunting and, and it's so, it, you know, it, it gave us a little starting credibility there. And then yep. that parlayed off into the hunting world and we introduced right. rifle scopes shortly. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. What's it like as you're as you're going through, you know, and you kind of mentioned the shotgun approach, and that's kind of the nice thing when you are starting out. We've we've mentioned, I know, just just around chatting before, where when you're not really on the map in a big way, you can try a lot, and you can afford to screw up a lot yes. you know nobody or, knows we could change <laughs> yeah. we could change directions you're the quickly. only one who knows yeah. you screwed yeah. up you can be very nimble what's it like as you start what kind of things do you look for in in i guess I keep saying what's it like but what was it like when you started to find things that didn't work weren't working out what kind of were some of those uh maybe it was obvious big things that kind of just hit you in the face where it was like hey this isn't gonna work we're gonna have to you know take another step another direction and and what does it look like when you started seeing something that was kind of beginning to work it was kind of this bright spot yeah it, well it's 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 interesting i think a lot of it starts off with your expectations so when if your expectation is that this is going to hit you know um our core customer and this is going to this is going to resonate with the majority of people that are that are interested in vortex or could be interested in vortex and then it doesn't so you kind of bet heavy and then it and then it and then it doesn't do as well as you want. In some cases, that means, well, it wasn't a good product or it wasn't a good idea. But in other cases, it means, no, it's got a place. You just maybe had the wrong expectation. And then um, vice versa, there's times where you've tried something and you thought, hey, this will be an okay product. It'll hit a little bit of the market and it goes nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, That's about, those are the good surprises. Yeah, those are, the good, those are yeah. the good surprises. So sometimes it's just adjusting you know, sort of your expectation. But there's certainly some times where you, where you hit and you miss. And I think the challenge for us as we've grown is to keep a lot of that kind of entrepreneurial spirit and that willingness to try new things. I think we've gotten better, though, about, um, about uh, sort of labeling something, hey, this is an experiment. 
you know, and right. and and we we won't we'll bet the farm on this, but this is an experiment. We we don't want to get away from not trying experiments. But a couple things that are nice is that pretty much the entire company over here hunts and shoots. So we've got a lot of customers internally. And the other thing is, is as we've grown, we can certainly tap into even more customer feedback, more retailer feedback. And so that has been really helpful. And so a lot of times you can kind of marry up the two feedback um, pieces and, and it can kind of give you a better idea if something's going to gonna go. But yeah, just, just probably like a lot of businesses that have been around as long as we have, you certainly have some some home runs, and you yeah. certainly have some strikeouts. Mm-hmm. We've we've had a couple. I think we'll probably talk about it later on. But there's at least one sitting on here in a table in front of us that I think it was one where we were actually ahead of our time on. It didn't do well initially. Oh yeah. And then as as time went on, it sort of got a little bit of a cult following too. Yeah. It, so. Right. We got a couple of teasers going towards these products. Yeah. I did want to ask one more question before maybe we start. I think a lot of the things that we're going to talk about too, almost almost if you look at each one of these individual products, and like you said, this will almost be quasi-biz marketing uh, info or something like that, podcast, each one of these products has its own story behind it. And as to kind of things that we had to do to listen to the customer and take feedback and develop and change things or sometimes give things the axe. What, uh, real quick though, what is in reality, for, for people who aren't familiar, or maybe, again, some of those people are a little cynical about sales guys versus engineers and MPD guys, what is the relationship between, at least here, you know, that's all we can speak to, sales, marketing, and NPD, and, and new product development, for those not familiar I, with that I, term? I'll let Joe talk to yeah. you, but I, I can jump, because I think ever since I've been here, I've sort of rode the fence on on yeah. both sides of that, it's sort of one foot in the product development, one foot in the sales. Because mm-hmm. you've used the product yeah, so yeah, extensively. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think it's because of using it and then really enjoying and liking products. You know, I think it comes down to that. But, you know, I think when you look at that difference, the guys in product development are very, very product-centered guys. You just, you like the stuff. You, 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 you use it, you enjoy it. You, you're very, like, wrapped into trying to build and make the best product that's out there. Where it can fall down is is where the guys, you know, more in sales, like Joe sees, is not everything that guys are really excited about his product, they don't, they don't always sell. They don't always appeal to everybody else's view or maybe the majority of other people out there. So you kind of, you're looking at the same thing, but, but different angles, different perspectives on it, I think. Yeah. Is the, no, I think that's a great way to look at it. I think the one thing that we've tried to do is we've, we've really tried to make the customer the center and the customer the starting point and then working backwards to us. Um, so, you know, you start with what the customers are asking for. You're starting with trends that you're starting to see with customers, um, getting that feedback, and then working back to a product. That's ideal. Now, in some cases, um, well, actually, in a lot of cases, the people that are creating the products, they're also customers. Yeah. So so there's some unique things there. In some cases, you can, you can you know, get too enamored maybe with the product that you're working on and maybe it fitting the type of thing that you want, but maybe the, the, the masses of the customers don't want. But in the other case, you know, it's been really cool having so many people in product development that use the product out in the field because a lot of times what they can do and, and not always, but a lot of times there's products that we can bring to market that um, that actually uh, people don't actually know that they wanted that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or maybe yeah. maybe some of their feedback, they didn't know exactly what they wanted. They've given p- uh, bits and pieces of it. And so it, it can, there is a really good, good uh, balance between the two. Um, just as far as our relationship with, with NPD, um, we're really tight. We meet, meet at least weekly. Um, in fact, when we do product development, we have um, we have uh, product development folks in there. We have um, we have sales in there. We have marketing in there. We have our supply chain. So we really try to do a good job of bringing all the different parts and pieces together. We have people who've been in the field that are actually using um, products. We've been in the people that have been in the field talking with customers and even talking with retailers who obviously have a have a lot of um, opportunity to interact with customers. And we try to bring all of that together. And then working backwards from the customer as the starting point and saying, you know, what is going to hit the majority of customers? What's going to make them say, wow. And so typically we start with giving them a wow experience, but we also start with what, you know, the majority of customers Mm -hmm. and who can we hit with, with kind of that wow experiences. But there's certainly products that we do that appeal to very smaller demographics as well. Yeah. I'm going to play dumb here for a second and and say, you know, or I guess I shouldn't say dumb, but I'm just going to play, uh, pretend that. Anyway, 
Uh, bad start. So, uh, restart here. <laughs> I'll ask you, so let's say it sounds like if you're trying to figure out a new product that's going to come to market, for example, I can only imagine that in these meetings that there is a fair amount of research trying to figure out what that majority of the customer is. You know, I heard you say that a couple of times, and I think that to some people, you know, listening, and some people that we've talked with, you know, talked with plenty of people like this on the forums or on social media, or you hear people call in, they might just ask the question, why don't you just make it all? You know, mm-hmm. if somebody asked for it, yeah. why, why can't you just go and make it? You know, what are, what are some of the reasons behind that uh, where you almost, why do we even have to choose what products come to market and yeah. don't? Why isn't it just as simple as throwing something out there, seeing what happens? You know, because no, there's definitely question. there's definitely requests that come in. I I saw one just this morning where you know people ask for certain things and just why haven't you done this yet? Yeah, I think part of that is is you know there there's there's only so much you can take on at any given point with anything in life. You've only got so many people. You've only got so many resources. Um, you know whether it's people designing and engineering or coming up with uh, with uh, 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 product. Um, what I was thinking, uh, samples and, and, um, there's just only so much that you can do. So we try we try to make sure that when we, you know, take an arrow out of that quiver, that it's really going to hit. And I actually think with Vortex, one of the things that we do is we, we, you maybe can say we're a little bit of a glutton for punishment in the sense that we take on a lot. Um, we typically come up with a lot of new products throughout, throughout the year. But one big th- reason that you want to do that is you want to make sure when you are working on a new product that you really put as much TLC into that product um, that you possibly can and make sure that when it comes out, it is a really good quality product. It is, it is, um, uh, you know, is going to function properly in some very harsh conditions. Um, and if you take on too much... Um, it's sort of like the jack of all trades, master of none, you know, nothing really gets done excellent. And yeah. so that's one of the reasons that we, that we you can't quite do everything all at once. Uh, now, it, it, you know, in some cases, if people could see the, the list, the laundry list of all the things we have in the hopper, they might see their particular one in the, in, uh, on the list. But for a lot of different reasons, um, we have to prioritize the way that we do, but we certainly, when we come out with something, we want it to be done high quality in an excellent way. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, and the, and the other thing I think people don't always realize is the tremendous amount of time and work that actually goes behind the scenes into coming up with a new product. And, you know, we've had stuff here that's been in development for three, four, yeah. five years sometimes. Yep. I mean, tremendous stretches of time right. and a lot of work, everything from, from design and performance to packaging and shipping. And it's just, there's a lot more to it mm-hmm. than, you know, especially when, know. Especially when you really have your hand in so much of it, you know. I think that it's probably possible that maybe you could come up with a higher volume of just stuff Right. If you just kind of took whatever you could as is right. and you didn't have, you know, so much of this custom almost, I'll say, you know, just approach to everything where, you know, um, if it's working with another vendor, uh, whether it's overseas or even domestically, they might have something that they've already done and you could just put your logo on it and sell it. But a lot of times, most of the time, really, I don't even know if I, most of the time, that's not kind of something that we want to do. We want to have this uh, full experience wrapped up in it where we've kind of really made sure that it's got the vortex touch. And that takes a lot of time, like you said, Paul. And I think, yeah, like you were mentioning some stuff on the, that list three, four, five years yeah, out. out. I think there. a lot of people don't quite realize that, yeah, an optical design and, and design the, the body around it and the packaging and all that right. stuff really. And here's, here's the other tough part about that too, Jim. When you think about those lead times, you know, it, it, it puts on us that you you really have to kind of be able to look into the future right. because mm-hmm. you're talking about a product that you're working on today that might not be sold for years. So you have to think what are you know what are our competitors doing? What what is going to come out between now and then, or when yeah. we roll that out? And so it's it's well, customers even want stuff. that in two or three years. Or yeah, the expectations yeah. maybe be even things higher. go completely in a different direction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you do you kind of have to. I mean, we don't we don't have a crystal ball, but we you try to do yeah. that. You <laughs> yeah. try to yeah. you try to look into the into the future and see what people want and I think as, as opposed to kind of just slapping your name on stuff you know you know you want to give them a reason well why should they go with Vortex right 
And, uh, and so we want to do something that's really innovative. Um, you know, one of our core values is innovator. So we want to do an innovative product. We want to do a product that really gives not just some innovative features, but really gives some benefits that maybe they're not, ex- you know, customers haven't experienced with any brand, including our own, mm-hmm. when we come out with a new product. Yeah. I think the other thing too, that, that maybe is not always easy to comprehend, but there are just, just limits to how much you can do in the fact that, you know, let's say somebody wanted, you know, this different slight variation of a Viper and this different slight variation of a Viper and another slight different variation for all their, you know, all these individual uh, applications. Well, you know, we do work through dealers across the nation, you know, and that that's one way to make it easier for people to get our products and, and get the brand out there. And, if a dealer gets a price catalog or a, or a, a product catalog and it has 12,000 different SKUs in there, that's going to be overwhelming. It's overwhelming to a lot of times for the end consumers, you know, when we get a lot of questions in every single day with, about even, even some of the products we have now, like what's the difference between a Viper HS and HST and HSLR and a bay? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, you bring up, a, you bring up a really good point is, is there's a balancing act you have to have between options and, and clarity. Mm-hmm. And and so there's a sweet spot, kind of uh, a frequency that you can get into that works just right. It's the right amount of options for the customers and the retailers. Um, but it's also the line is clear and easy to understand and easy to make a decision. And sometimes we've been in the sweet spot and sometimes we get out of it and we get a few too many options. And maybe in some cases we've had, we, we haven't had enough options. But one thing that is also, I think, really critical is anytime you're saying yes to something, you're simultaneously saying no to something else. True. Um, just in life in general, right? We said yes to have this podcast right now. Well, that means that there's various things that we that we can't do. Um, so when we say yes to a product um, or, or products, a certain assortment of products that we're creating, we're also saying no to something else. And so if we had too many variations, if we, if we decided to do a bunch of variations, let's say use your example of those Viper binoculars, um, well, that might help a little bit, but we're also saying we're saying no to some other pro- projects and products that we could be doing that maybe could really better serve the overall uh, market, our overall customer base better. So that's a that's a really important uh, distinction that we have to make in here is is what do we say yes to, and, and then of course what are we saying no to? Yeah. So what do you say we dive in on some of these? products they've Let's been sitting here we keep sitting looking here, at yeah. them we keep i'm sure there's a lot more that we can talk about with each one of these uh mark you've been you've been uh, real quick too how long you've been here again I'm going on going on 10 yeah, yeah in fact next month I yeah think. okay so, right yeah. on so you've seen a lot of the development of pretty much all these yeah. as well a fair amount there's a few that were before my time yeah. but um but yeah no that's a lot of familiar faces here and even you know, and and some that were developed early on and were solid enough products. I mean, they're they're still on the line today, yeah, be- because yeah. they Amazingly. were such good products. Yeah. So, um, it's cool to see those guys around as well. How should we start? Should we start with some of the big misses or some of the big hits? I think people want to hear the misses. Let's That's go to gonna the misses. end up being <laughs> some products. Go to the That's truly gonna end up being some more of the products you haven't heard of before. Right. We've mentioned it a couple of times. It's sitting right in front of me. I have a brand new inbox never open. This might be worth something someday. Oh, by the way, I was eBay. instructed do not open that. Oh, ever, never, <laughs> ever, ever. <laughs> This will never be open. If, if oxygen gets in that wrapper, it'll immediately <laughs> shrivel up. Uh, this is a University of Wisconsin Badgers take it to the game sportocular. Yep. Uh, for those of you listening, this is a, a small 7 by 18 millimeter binocular. It actually has individual hinges for each side in case one eye is really way down or left or right than the other eye. I don't. I think what you're trying to say is it'd be great on your next sheep hunt, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or exactly. <laughs> not not just the football game, but you can. Yeah. What? Or some, sometimes you just want to make some, like kind of a little oh, yeah. uh, centipede action. Yeah. 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 A little. That's yeah. like that's yeah. like yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Only the people watching on YouTube will know what we were just doing. <laughs> um, so, it, again, you, you said this was something we really thought was going to just send all of our kids to college. This Sportacular yes. was going to be the biggest thing. Look, it even yeah. says, even on this Badgers version, it says Go Badgers on it. There's a Corn Huskers one over here, too. It says it says Huskers. I was going to name it. my yacht Sportacular. Um. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so, w- the idea was that. I guess, and you guys can go into it more. We were going to sell 
these things to every college professional sport team ever. You name it, we were going to do um, collegiate licensed uh, for each university. We were going to probably try to go to the NFL, go to Major League Baseball, you know, soccer, you name it. We were going to put uh, their uh, their Pantone color and their logo on it and put it in the clamshell, and, and they were going to sell by the thousands and tens of thousands. It seems like such a good idea. What went wrong? You know, so I don't know if I would say what went wrong. So kind of a couple things happened. Number one is um, is it can be difficult to deal with licensees uh, or, or to be a, you know, to license a product. You can't necessarily choose what you want to do and what, what you don't want to do. There's somebody there that kind of has to okay those things. Um, so that, that was one level of friction that we weren't, you know, just our, probably our company personality. We're kind of, we like to be trailblazers and, and trendsetters. And, and so just this, the whole nature of having a license was one thing that we we struggled with. But another thing that was um, was the initial orders were typically pretty good. Uh, you get a couple hundred uh, from a from a typically it was a bookstore, university bookstore. Yeah, is the okay. one that bought the majority yeah. of these. And so you know, just a little bit. Uh, I know I can I'll only speak for myself here, but a little bit of um, being naive and and young and around two thousand and two. As you'd sell, you know, two, three hundred of these sportoculars, and you just assumed, hey, these are these are going to fly off the shelf, you know, uh, you know, before Saturday's ball game, and then and then they're going to order three hundred for next week and three hundred for the week after that. Well, that didn't exactly happen. <laughs> if you go into a lot of these university bookstores, I mean, it is just sort of like somebody just threw up a bunch of collegiate licensed products, you know, uh, you know, they've got everything under the sun, and so the sportoculars just sort of blended in with Disa- everything else. Disappeared on the rack. Of- yeah, yeah, you really almost might have had a better shot if you made. Them the opposite color, it yeah. would have stood out. <laughs> yeah, green badgers. Back yeah, <laughs> so so you get an order, and that that might be your only order for the entire year. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then they'd come back the following year, and so it just we it didn't resonate. Again, I wouldn't say it's so much it was a miss. People were interested, and they purchased them, but I think it had to do a little bit with where our passions l- lied. Um, and where the feedback from the customers were, it was far greater on, you know, something that would be a $300 roof prison binocular. You know, that's what we all like to use a really, you know, high quality binocular. Um, our customers loved it. The retailers loved it. It just so happened they would sell better. So that was a nice (laughs) thing too. Um, so it just, it kind of, it was a combination, I think of just, uh, what we were passionate about and what and what the customer feedback was uh, that really sort of led to the demise, if you will, of the sportacular. Paul, I don't. What do you What are your thoughts? Yeah, that one always felt like completely out of my wheelhouse. I remember <laughs> it, and I was, <laughs> you know, right. it definitely like like we said. It's uh, even though Joe mentioned it for sheep hunting, it was not a not a sheep hunter's no, binocular. So. No, not at all. <laughs> it was on the it was on the low end of the quality uh, spectrum. Oh, you had yeah, how really many nice. college teams we had? I think we like eight covered or the 10. whole Big so Ten. We, you said we, Kansas was we, in there. We, we had Kansas. We had Nebraska, who, which, like you said, I can't remember if they are in the Big Ten or not at the time. Obviously, Wisconsin. Wisconsin was the only one we had two colors. We had white and red. Oh. Um, home team there. We had Michigan. Um, we had, I believe we had Illinois. And we had Ohio State. And, uh, yeah, so we had about eight teams to start with. And it's we like, thought we'd kind of start start – small and see uh see where it went from there it's like pokemon you got to catch them all if anybody out there has every team you're really sitting on some some gold right there i was gonna say if you've got one of these you've got a living piece i was gonna say i have never seen the illinois one or a kansas one so if you have any of those take a picture of it and send it to us that'd be awesome Uh, yeah that would be (laughs) that would be the scavenger hunt right yeah (laughs) um What's what's an, what's another one over here? So this little yellow thing, it looks very similar in many ways. This is the twister. This is like what what was this? Was this like one of the Vortex's first binoculars? It's got the old Hurricane kind of logo on it. Yeah, it was uh, one of the first. Oh, another seven by eighteen. Yeah, it was kind of off the same platform. Although this one um, had individual um, eyepiece focuses, so actually oh, there was yeah. no There's center no focus center. wheel. Instead, what we put there was a compass. A compass. So if you lay that thing as flat as can be and you wait for about five minutes, maybe grab a cup of coffee, <laughs> and you come back, <laughs> that thing is going to s- get fairly close to true north. <laughs> if, 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 I'm if, waiting on it. Is, is it? It's going. Is it? Is it finding it? Yeah. It's almost there. I started this about 30 seconds ago, too. Yeah. Jim, are you within 30 feet of a piece of metal? <laughs> 
Yeah, I no, don't think it's it was get it fully close. it was fully waterproof. Um, so okay. we had the Twister, which is the little guy. We had a Typhoon, which is a little bit larger, a little bit bigger, yeah. eight by twenty six and a ten by twenty six, I think. And then we had we actually had the first iteration of the Solo Monocular, which has gone through a couple different iterations. But that one is actually survived. survived. Yeah, that one survived. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Solo was was kind of this bright blue, and then the Twister and the Typhoon had. Uh, had this bright yellow color, and Paul, I love how you described the other color. What was the color? <laughs> I think they were a fine, a fine mud brown. Yeah. <laughs> a fine <laughs> mud brown, nonetheless. Yeah. 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 Um, Earth, earthy. earthy. They were earthy. It was an earth yeah. tone. Yeah. Earthy. Yes. Well, that fit, yes. that fit in well with Dave. I, I think we were, we were kind of looking at those for sort of the outdoor, not necessarily yeah. the hunting crowd, but the outdoors, I guess kind of the granola crowd. Yeah, as you so yeah it explains, yeah, you know, it went along yeah. with Dave's original website. Right. Yeah, so they were just, the whole idea behind them was going to be really small, compact, waterproof, really rugged products. And people just didn't like them? So, well, it, again, part of it was it, I think it just, it led, a, well, a, two things. It led one, again, where our passions were or were not, um, which was less in that, in that crowd and that market and more in the, in the hunting crowd, hunting and shooting crowd. That's where our passions were. But also, uh, you're right, that, that customer base typically isn't using optics as much. Yeah. They're more, they really, they, they like to go out, they like really amazing views, but they like to experience them really with their own eyes. They're trying to take in kind of a full scene where, um, where you know, hunters and shooters, there's a little bit more um, to, to what they're trying to do. Yeah. There's more and, of a purpose. The, you know, and the guys buying, I mean, the, there were there were outdoor granola people that bought optics, but right. when you look at the, the list of gear that someone might yes. buy in those, Optics was way, way, way was on, on, the, on the priority yeah. list. Yeah, it was an if and maybe yeah. kind of a thing. Right. Um, well, then I think oftentimes a person who has those interests, if they do recognize that they do, they have a need for optics or, or a desire for that level of observ- observation, they're probably going to gravitate more towards those, you know, quote, hunter a real, optics. A real bino. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. And, and they would, yeah, they'll probably Or the opera Look, glasses. Now, speaking of real binos. This is one that I had to throw in here real quick. This now, is this one is too, not too bad. The listeners can't see. This was not technically Vortex. If you're watching on YouTube, yeah. here you go to the camera. Uh, it is a, a uh, black and gold yes. small Very shiny. binocular. I don't even, it doesn't even have a designation for objective and magnification. It just, it just it, it is. And um, we actually used to have a model with a handle on it, too, I remember. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Where's really the handle? Dis- no, I'm just really disappointed have a handle. The handle. It comes in this felt case um, as well, which is pretty pretty fancy. But the Masterpiece Opera Glass Collection, and you could, you could, you know, fine opera goers could view <laughs> their opera singer. And, and, you could, even, and you could look good when you were looking. Right, oh, you would look right. good. And you this, this right one at. even works. It has a red LED, or no, that's probably not even an LED. I don't think LEDs were around yet, but I'm just kidding. But yeah. it has a little red light for reading the, you know, Well, and if someone explain why notes. the red. Paul, why don't you explain why the red? It's a red light in oh, the it's middle. Just, it was for use at night when things were dark in yeah. the opera hall. So you didn't, you know, you you didn't, didn't, disturb, didn't disturb the opera singers and or the, the neighbors. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. big deal. Yeah, so those were, yeah, though, though we were, were always going to want to keep around one or two of those for the if we ever have a museum someday. Oh yeah, and I was explaining before we started this because I brought this up here. I actually went down to binocular repair and asked if they had any of these left. They said yes for the museum someday. Yep. And uh, I remember that you wouldn't see those in very often because we didn't sell a ton of them. But when you'd have like a new person in binocular repair, I used to work down there for a while and an opera glass would come in, the look on their face when it was like <laughs> new guy uh, initiation. Hey, fix these. Just well, <laughs> just this like... Uh. It's funny. We had the same thing for the salespeople. When they first came on, it was sort of like, hey, you get the sportoculars in the Masterpiece <laughs> Opera Glass collection. We figure if you can sell those things, you can sell the good stuff. You're going to be good. Yeah, The true yep. test. Um, let's talk about... Oh no, we're still on misses. We have two more now. These are those ones are a little bit silly. These, these two more here are they're like Vortex with the new logo on it uh, products. But we we're gonna official go over Vortex, a, yeah, yeah, official Vortex. Um, we we're gonna go over maybe some of the reasons that that go into why a product doesn't stick around. For example, sure. The one that I have here is the Hurricane Seven by Fifty. Now this thing is a tank. 
Yes. It's as big. far as like wielding yeah. it and holding it. What's the deal? Why did what what was the thought process behind coming out with a Hurricane 7x50? What what went on there? I What's think that was really so. Seven by fifty is a is a traditional marine binocular. Is it? It, it right. is. So, and part of the reason is, and I won't get super technical, but it, it gives you a really large exit pupil, which is uh, which is really great when you're on a boat that could be rocking up and down, um, and and just overall just really good light gathering wise. Also, individual eye cups because typically you're you're looking at the horizon. You're not focusing between near and far very often. And, and really, the gist was that was sort of an experiment to see, hey, how many of our customers are, are, in, are in the marine world? How many of them are right. interested in a product like that? Yeah. So actually, the, the odd thing is... Marine being on boats. On boats, right. So, so the, the odd thing is, is, is optically, it's a fantastic... It is really It's nice. phenomenal. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Now, it is. It is an absolute tank, as you said. It's a poro prism, so it's got that 90-degree bend in the middle. It's not a roof prism, which has kind of these straight... Tubes the old dog leg style. Yep. Yeah, but if you, if you, I mean, just purely looking through them is really enjoyable. But yeah, trying to lug those things around, and certainly if you're going to use it for anything, uh, focusing, you know, uh, at various distances a lot, it would be really annoying because you got to because you have to do each in, individual in, individually. One. But yeah, so that that was sort of if if anything, that was a product that just solidified. You know, hey, our our the, our hunters and shooters aren't uh, aren't moonlighting as uh, as, as marine <laughs> right. biologists. Right. <laughs> I'm telling. Yeah, but like you said, it is amazing when you look at a poro prism how good you can make the optics in a poro prism for like if you compare a poro prism to a roof prism generally speaking all else is similar kind of like same quality level price point same price point yeah poro prisms are usually yeah, going to have can, a little bit of an edge yeah you know, absolutely they're you can, more wieldy you can build a um, optically a much nicer poro prism right for a much less money than a comparable roof prism i right. think that's yeah. something that a lot of folks don't know they look at that design like, oh that's old school you know that's that can't be as good as you know modern designs but yeah like you said you can actually get a very high quality optical system for yeah, you know, it's bang just, for the buck. They're solid, but they are. It's a know, trade a off, more right? Cum- yeah, trade off. A little bit more cumbersome. You Not know. quite as durable because those prisms aren't stacked on one another. Durability right. is, I mean, uh, portability isn't as good. You don't, you're, you're not able to, you know, store it and carry it as easily. But yeah, there's definitely some optical advantages. This one stuck around for a surprising amount of time, I will say. Yeah, it, it was did. gonna line up for a while. It, it did. did. Yeah. And when I get my captain's license, I'll be going over <laughs> to grab me a set of those. There you uh, have it. Yeah. What's the deal with the? Uh, I brought in the muzzy, the muzzle loader scope. Paul, you want yeah, to start? Yeah, that, I mean that's actually a really nice little scope. It was it was very focused on a particular segment of buyers, though. It was one X, so it had no magnification to it. Yeah, and the purpose for that was to meet legal muzzle loading requirements that were out there in a couple of states. Although Utah it kind of got down to one. Utah at the end, was the only one. Right. And uh, people were allowed to run scopes in Utah, but they had to have no magnification. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, for a lot of guys, shooting a scope is it's a lot easier than shooting iron sights, especially as you get older. So there were good reasons, even though it was only 1X, to use a scope versus just using iron sights. So it actually did quite well. It was until, a hit before it was a miss. It, until it Utah yeah. changed the law and then yeah. the market evaporated Well, for and that's it. maybe where our uh, crystal ball uh, short-circuited maybe by a year or something <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah, that was no, timing. But, that, that was but actually, timing it's a on. really good example of, of making a decision um, that uh, making a tough decision based off of um, certain variables. In this case, it was the law. We pretty much all knew um, if those states, yeah. and particularly Utah, if they changed the law and added magnification, well, instantly that Everybody scope wants magnification. it isn't desirable yeah. at oh, all. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. right. So, for, so for at the time that it was, yeah, they were flying. Uh, off our shelves and off off retailer shelves, but um, but and that's where you just you know they, we started to hear a little bit of chatter that maybe that would go away, um, but we just decided hey there's a lot of customers that are interested in this they like the product and let's just let's stay with it. But then I think it was around the turn of the year yeah. that yeah, that that the, changed the came out. and yeah, then yeah. you know we had to uh, we had to find uh, more unique ways of uh, of selling those. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's coming back though. <laughs> Mark, is you it were explaining back? that now the muzzleloader scope is all of a sudden this like you can't find it. People are looking for it all over the place, but why? I mean, I think there's there's are there still some states that have this reg? I'm trying to think. I think there are a few. I know Colorado is very uh, stringent on its muzzleloader regulations. You can't use pellets. You have to use loose powder. Uh, I believe are they still 
Are they open sites only, Paul, or think, can you I use a zero X? No, I think they're or open. 1X. I think they're requiring open sites. Yeah, yeah. Mm. but mm. you know, it's it, there may be some states they'll they'll uh, as you get older and you know your eyes start to struggle with iron sights. Some states I think will allow you perhaps mm-hmm. to use an optic at that point, mm. and so there might there might still be a niche or two out there. Idaho, where it, it fits a legal. Yeah, because yeah. I had I a, remember one of the buddy of, a buddy of mine. He got you know what. I want to say it was like, don't quote me, check your local regulations, but it might have been Idaho. His father had, we're talking about this the other day, uh, was, uh, and this is, uh, I guess, a good note. If you like to fish out there, he'd got hung up, I believe, on a limb or, you know, rock or something like that was going to break off his line. Always look away. We're going to do that. I think maybe he didn't. He actually took, Uh I believe, a split Uh. shot to the eye. And so, and it was because of the state that they were in, uh, you had a, a 1X, um, you could use, uh, no, you couldn't, but they said because of your, your right, eye condition, been injured or, um, yeah. you, can, you can use that mm. scope. So he was digging all around trying to find a 1X uh, muzzleloader scope and, oh, wow. and right. couldn't. Right. I think the guys that have them and need them are definitely holding on to them. Yeah, right. I, went on, I went on eBay or something thinking I'd find one for like 30 bucks because, you know, at this point, I mean, it looks like a 1 to 4 scope, but it doesn't have a mag ring on it. It's got two turrets on it to adjust the reticle, but nothing else it's just nice, X. nice simple little skull yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and i remember i was finding them for like what they cost brand new because yeah there's just not many of them yeah. but anyway that is the old muzzy the old like muzzy. you said really it, it was a hit until it became a miss just due to laws and stuff um last one we're going to bring up here which again is kind of a is kind of a it's in the miss category ish ish it timing. was kind of ahead of timing. its time. Yeah, yeah. timing. Yep. This is the XBR crossbow scope. And I actually, uh, yeah, there we go. We'll have to sneak it out of its box. This was brand new in box when oh, I found it this morning. This is like, yeah. yeah, this is one of very few that we Collector's have item. left here. Now, this is, if you look at it, I like to always, okay, so you know when um, I always bring up, you know, the inevitable car reference, right? So, you know, a car company will come up with a new engine. Like Ford came out with their EcoBoost or whatever. And then the EcoBoost goes in everything. They modify it to do a gazillion things. It goes in rally cars. It goes in trucks. It goes in anything. <laughs> we had the Viper series. Anything can be related to a car analogy or a SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> that is 100% correct. We had the Viper series, and this optical system basically could be used for anything. I mean, because we have, you had the Viper HS. You know, hunting, shooting. You had the HST, which is like this quasi long range shooting hunting scope. You had the PST Gen One at the time, which had illumination, first yeah. focal plane radicals. HSLRs. H- yep, the HSLRs. We had an XBR for crossbows. There was a yeah. Viper for darn near everything. There was. And this one is really unique, but Paul is going to have to talk to it because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was you know I was heavily involved in that one, but it was unfortunately it was one that it definitely falls into the ahead of its time category. You know, we we'd been kind of watching the the crossbow market grow and the interest in long range crossbow shooting, and and we thought at the time, you know, we were doing PSTs and a bunch of long range scopes, and you know, hey, we can do a, you know, a good fitting long range crossbow scope, and so that one was it was sort of pieced together with a number of different components and features out of the PST and the Viper series, but the downfall was it it really ended up. It, it was priced too high. It was yeah, very, expensive, very for, expensive for what a crossbow, you know, that, that buyer typically looked at. I remember that most crossbows already come with a scope. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I think, and I, you know, I can take some of the blame for that. We used our sort of long-range shooting experience to make this a very capable long-range scope, but it sort of fell out of the wheelhouse of a lot of crossbow guys because it relied on, on knowledge and experience that came over from the long-range rifle shooting world. Yeah. So it, it, it ended up being a little bit too complex. Because it uses MOA instead of yards, right? It did, and it, and it also sort of revolved around the turret, uh, the idea of guys being able to put a, a customized yardage turret on the scope. Mm. Oh. And so that was just completely alien at the time to the yeah. crossbow world. Right. So, But, you know, what we've seen since then is is people are searching high and low to find these things, and they they become very much a cult scope and People are paying a lot of money for them. Yeah. So that's been satisfying to see. But yeah, the timing was bad. That was it on that one. If you're, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, just quick, if you're listening to this and you're familiar with the Viper series, imagine a Viper 2.5 to 10 by 44 HS LR, because it has an exposed elevation turret, with a PST illumination on the eyepiece. 
capped windage turret. Capped windage turret. Right. It has one MOA per click. Super coarse adjustments. And parallax is set at 75? 75 yards. We mm, were trying man. to hit a compromise in there. You know, that yeah. was a little bit touchy. You didn't, you, you, you had guys that were shooting anywhere from 35 to 150 yards. Mm-hmm. So it was, you were sort of trying to hit a, a middle ground. You know, it wasn't ideal for the guys at close range, although they could turn magnification down and not have any focusing issues. Mm. But then the extreme end of that was guys shooting out at 100 or 150. And so you could, you know, the focusing could get a little tough at very long ranges. Yeah. So. Yep. I get a call every now and again, several times a year. Hey, you guys got anything like this? Yeah. Oh. We did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should have called yeah. a couple of years back. It had kind of a neat reticle in it, too. It was, it a, it was a glass oh, yeah, hatch right. design, mm-hmm. just a different right. look to anything else we'd done. So, yeah, it was yeah. neat. I think, I think Paul's right. It was just a little bit ahead of its time. Crossbows were really growing. I do think you hit it They'd on the head. They just become legal for you know the general shooter, too. The fact that they came with scopes already on them, and if, if you, of course, yeah. if you were just getting into the into crossbows, you know, why why would you, right? You got to learn how to use the thing. You got to learn. I mean, and it already came with a scope. So why not? Let's figure yeah, out how and this, this. And this scope yeah. sold for, retailed for what, basically what a lot of crossbows lot sold of crossbows, for. Yeah. And <laughs> while rifle guys might buy that argument, yeah. crossbow right. guys weren't in right. a quick hurry to adopt right. it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say? We'll head to some of these big products for Vortex, too. We got a couple of them laid out here. Uh, which one do we start with? First... How about you've, got, you've got one of the Gen One Vipers over there, and that that goes way back. That's that yes, was, this is part of the Viper. Very, we'll talk about that. Yeah, this that is I mean, the Viper three to nine by forty. It's yeah. not an HS. It's not an HST. Nothing. It is a Viper. It was a great all around scope. You know, when we first started out, we had basically two lines of rifle scopes: the Diamondbacks and the Vipers. And there weren't many SKUs, five or six SKUs maybe in both of those lines. Mm-hmm. So our entire rifle scope lineup was about ten different scopes. <laughs> and this one here, it's this three to, to nine, was just a really nice. This the Viper series at the time. We sort of had the basic Diamondbacks, and then the step up line was the Vipers. So this was at the time our high grade scope yeah. line. This was the best thing we did, and I mean they were very nice. They're very capable scopes. Um, we sold these up to just a few years ago, and some of the six uh, and a half to twenties are still around. Yeah, part of that yep. line yeah. is still here today. So, I mean, uh, Thirty mil tube. Yeah. It's the yeah. only scope I've ever seen with a cap turret that's capable of dialing long range too. Yeah, yeah, they've yeah. dialed repeatedly, but but nice glass, very classic look to them. Um, you know, one of the very kind of the rugged. neat things, it did have a very unique feature that we put on there in the mag ring, which was, I forget the name of that feature. Oh, my it's God. A, it's kind of a raised I think it was ledge. The mag, that, view. The mag view. Mag view, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's nice. what it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it gave the scope a very distinctive look, mm-hmm. and then it also had a functional value, is that it was a little bit like a throw lever almost ahead of its time that you could you could get a hold of and turn when things very got cold like and, lever, and yeah. everything yeah. got stiff. So, that thing yeah, was, it was sweet. Was a very I also, good scope. I also remember we have the three to nine here, and even this three to nine is a little longer than most three to nines. But that four to twelve, man, that thing. That was a the, long scope. That was a yeah. long scope, and it I remember that scope. like the, the yeah. clamping surface that you had essentially that that center tube where you could clamp your rings onto was so extensive. I think you could have mounted that thing on anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it was flexible. Had so much way. room for for movement. Yeah. But those were great scopes for for us and obviously customers. They were really rugged, and that and the Diamondback line. And of course, I, I think all of our scopes, but it was really good being a first introduction into right. rifle scopes. Um, you know, we we couldn't miss, and we couldn't afford to have some scopes that couldn't do the job and couldn't hold up, especially with our VIP warranty. And so, yeah, those things will always hold a special place, I think, mm-hmm. for us here, uh, just being the in the intros uh, to us into rifle scopes. Yeah, I and mean, it's, and it's funny to think that you know now we look at that, and at the time that was the that was our high end scope. Yeah. Well, now, of course, we've gone way, way above that with the PSTs and the Razors and the AMG scope. We've we've jumped way up higher. Yeah, than that I think these retailed for the three to nine, two ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. And so oh now, my gosh, yeah, geez. now we, now we've got an AMG that retails for twenty five hundred bucks, twenty two hundred bucks. Yeah. So yeah, Somewhere so there, it's yeah. a little little bit different scale. Yeah. Those original Vipers, though, man, like you said, I mean, that was my first scope was that four to twelve, mm. um, and. Uh, I mean, optic, like you said, optically, incredibly sound, bulletproof, mm-hmm. sleek. I mean, they had a lot of things. They still have a lot of things going for them. Like, yeah. I would never hesitate to put that on oh, any I, rifle. I, yet I, I wouldn't yeah. hesitate to go hunting with one of those today. Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. Was that around the same time as this original Diamondback that we have here? 
this binocular that the Diamondbacks were a little bit before, a little um, before yeah, that. a little bit before because we binoculars is really where we kind of cut our teeth. Um, and I remember t- Sam designing this outside of Dad's office. Yep, in SolidWorks when he like just started using SolidWorks and looking at this design that Sam had and thinking that thing looks amazing yeah kind of that diamond checker pattern mm-hmm. and, and for the grip, uh, grippy yeah, for the yeah. grippy and and yeah that was uh that came out and it just that was one of those products where all the stars aligned kind of the 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 quality and the price point the ergonomics the look um just the 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 year that it hit um just everything was just sort of aligned perfectly for that product and it mm-hmm. just you know um retailers really gravitated gravitated towards it they they obviously could see that that was going to be a good seller and customers just flocked to it and it was just kind of like that perfect bang for your buck just perfect uh binocular not too expensive uh you know not too inexpensive everything was just in that sweet spot yeah just the puzzle pieces were all right yep. on that one the look the price say, and it looked availability good. all of it and it, it looked just, and you're right uh, and it, mm-hmm, and it looked yeah. good too most so. people are familiar with the green version but there used to be a coyote tan version as well were, there was a little bit of a miss on that. There was, yeah. yeah that yeah. It actually that was a, that was a miss. So oh, first of all, it's it was hard to get that rubber to come out just perfect. That coyote color. Um, sometimes there was some spotting there. Oh yeah. And um, and when it did, it looked nice. But a lot cool. in a lot of cases, yeah, it was sort of like the. It was sort of everybody looked at. I mean, even if when you would sell it to a retailer, the retailer would say. Even if they like the coyote color, they'd say that coyote color is cool, but but give me the green one. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, right. you know, uh, it's like, uh, well, you know, uh, it's not that cool then, I guess. But uh, yeah, so that was a li- that was a little bit of miss that with the spotting that would happen, uh, and then and then again, kind of that finding that sweet spot between um, having the uh, the right amount of options for customers, but also having clarity for yeah. customers. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we, I think we overdid it a little bit. Yeah, like were the Coyote versions any different other than just the color and stuff like that? No, there, yeah, there was nothing different other yeah. than just the color. Yep. They did look sweet, though. They did. And yeah. the interesting thing is now there's a new Diamondback, and this Diamondback still stays around as the Diamondback Classic in some right. arenas. You can still find it out there. Uh, but I thought, I thought it was uh, pretty cool when we updated this Diamondback, and Sam, our, our other brother, has been working on a number of different things for, you know, like he mentioned in this AMG podcast with the military, and was working on AMG at the time. But he did break away for a bit, to go back and design the new Diamondback binocular. It was almost kind of like, am he I did. right there? He did, yeah. That's awesome. No, so he kind of like his baby. Yep. So, yeah, that was yeah that was one of the first, and, and he broke he broke away to, to do that. So it was, it was pretty cool, pretty That's nostalgic. Pretty, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny with that Diamondback, because I remember when we were talking about updating those, and, like, I get, you know, technologies and optics and things like right. that, but when we we're talking about the aesthetic, I was like, Man, I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you improve on perfection. <laughs> then I saw the new Diamondbacks. Well, you're and right. I, and he's I done it. I, I, he's done it. Yeah. And, and I, maybe, and maybe that's why you know Sam did it. It's like we've definitely treated the Diamondback binoculars with kid gloves because it's kind of one of those things. If it ain't yeah, broke, don't fix butter, it. Yeah. So like anytime. There's discussion on you know adjusting the hinge, adjusting the look. You know, you know, hey, these might cost a little bit more. Should we raise the price? I mean, every you can feel everybody, especially us old timers. You can kind of feel like everybody <laughs> creeping up in their seat and the tension in the shoulders. And, yeah. It's know, happening it's right like, now. We're not even doing right it for real. Yeah, I'm stressed yeah. out. Uh-huh. I'm sweating just thinking about it. <laughs> so yeah, there's the, there's a few products that have that you know that have that vibe around here at Vortex, and the Diamondback binoculars is one of them. That is true. Don't mess with the recipe. Yeah, if you're new at <laughs> Vortex, you got to know that could be a landmine you're stepping on. <laughs> Let's just redo these things. I never liked that name, anyways. Like it's not going to work out. Oh uh, man, you can just see the veins popping. <laughs> right, right. How about now? I grabbed a Strike Fire Two here, and oh, I yeah. went down this morning uh, to the guys down in, in you know Rifle Scope Repair, and and I went down to the demo area, and I I asked some people if they had a Strike Fire One, and I remember the looks I got was a little bit like I had walked downstairs from Mars. Yeah, um, I right. think that the Strike no. Fire 2 now has been around for quite some time. A yeah. lot of people forgot that there was a 1. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was probably, was it, was that one of our first, or was it the first red dot that first we did? First red dot. It was what, the first one. What yeah. the heck happened? What, what's going through our minds when we're doing red dots? We're talking about Paul, let's start going on that from one. bird yeah, watching is, to now putting stuff on AR-15. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, an, it's a really, it is an interesting story. I mean, we've been kind of toying with the idea for a while. It didn't just pop up out of the right. blue. And we you know, we kind of looked at some different concepts. It's 
funny that the, the I tell you the one thing I remember about it is your brother Sam was always very much in the ARs. Very he much. was he mm-hmm. was at, he was very early into that type of shooting and the rifles. And there was a, there was an incident that happened back, and many people in the industry will remember this very well. I won't throw any names out there, but a very well known outdoor writer mm. made a comment about that he felt that ARs had no place in the world outside right. of, say, police and law enforcement, that the normal sportsman had no use for an AR. And what was really, I can, rem- I just remember that clear as a bell. It was like a, this game-changing thing, and, and it sparked this gigantic uproar in the, sh- in the shooting sports about all people just came out after him because there were so many people that actually were like your brother. And before it was as widely known as it is now with ARs and people enjoying them and shooting them, it was, it was I'd say, a little more under the covers at that time, although many, many people were. Um, but it just all of a sudden, I think it illuminated with a spotlight the fact that there were a lot of people out there shooting AR-15s, and they really enjoyed it, and they were very vocal about their rights to have that gun. Right. And it, I think it just immediately showed the size of that market and where it was headed and how it was growing. And at that point, it was like it was it was a must. You knew that red red dots went with ARs. You know, we knew that back yeah. then. So it to me that just drove this thing yeah. forward from that point on. And yeah, I, I think you you nailed it. I mean, it certainly sparked a lot. Not only a lot of those users and their rights, just Second Amendment, uh, you know, discussions right. of what that actually means. Um, certainly I think this was right around 2008, 2009. So obviously a certain administration got in, in <laughs> as well. Mm-hmm. So it, it was kind of like the, the perfect storm of just, you know, political things and, 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 uh, just interest in that, the ARs, we introduced this product and I remember we were, it was kind of, I would say cautiously optimistic I think that's, that would a, maybe yeah, be the best way, to, way to describe it from the standpoint that we, we 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 thought that's that that it would do well but we didn't know we had never done a red dot we were just yeah. a couple years into rifle yeah. scopes and the things just i mean they just took oh off. my gosh it's it, it's a yeah. landmark product yeah, in our, yeah. instantly yeah. I, I i think probably it took three to six months and that was our single best-selling product product that we had yeah. from, oh, a, yeah. from a unit yeah. standpoint going out the door. And, um, it was just, yeah, it was just, it just, just kind of lit the world on fire. It's, it's and it was a great price point too. Mm-hmm. And I think that was another big thing that really fit, um, with a lot of our products was just f- bang for the buck. Mm-hmm. It was one of the first red dots, um, probably widely known red dots that wasn't three, four, five hundred dollars or wasn't just dirt cheap. Right. You know, right. and so it kind of right. hit this sweet spot, which is which especially in the early days for Vortex, that was kind of what we were known for was hitting this sweet spot between with that that melded quality, but also a good price point. And so I think it was a combination of all those things politically and us. You know, if, if we're gonna, I mean, we had some misses. We went over, but th- but kind of finding this sweet spot in Red Dot that just really wasn't out there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was. I mean, it's a. It, it had a very a nice, somewhat unique look to it. Guys really mm-hmm. liked the appearance mm-hmm. to it. We we packaged it with a ring mount at the time, and it it, so guys it's could convenient. literally buy it in the box, and you could you could take it home and mount it right on your AR very yeah. easily. Um, but had the foot yeah, caps a, on it. Uh, one one thing though that was a little bit of a miss was the power button. It was on the side. Where you, where it was yeah. on the side. People mm-hmm. would bump it, and so a lot of times when they would shut their case, it would turn it on. And then they'd go to use it, and their battery had burned out. And so that was one of the big... There was a few different changes that we made when we went to the two, but that was one that we made. It had a night vision button. Right. And, and that people would be all the time. <laughs> yeah. People would all the time say, my yeah. dot doesn't work. And then they'd send it in, and we'd push the night vision button, and it would turn it back to regular Dave mode. And we'd be like, it works now. <laughs> that, <you> sorry. <laughs> that, that, w- that was a great, that was a great yeah. point. And no, so if, it, if it, it, was, it was either that, the night vision button had been pushed, or the other one was, I thought when I hit this, instantly I can see a night vision. And uh, oh. so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know, it was not Actually, a turn. Was, yeah, it was not a magical button That's that right. could, you know, it pay off your mortgage. the sun off. Get your night vision. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, so there was a few different things that we had to tweak, so. A couple things. But, you know, it has been interesting, too, and I guess, um, you know, having gone to school and learned about economics and things of that nature, uh, seeing how the political climate can affect people's just, just sense of 
what they need, what they value highly, right. you know, because yeah. we've seen it and, and everybody talks about it. It's, it's no news, you know, that when an election period comes around, there's a lot of uncertainty and especially around our industry with second amendment and things like that. And, you know, that has caused a lot of, I mean, you go out and you try and buy an AR, uh, lower today at this point in time, and you can just go out and find one and buy it. All of a sudden, an election period is up. There are no AR parts anywhere. Right. There are no right. red dots. There are no like anything that has to do with an AR is is like is gone. Shelves are bare. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, um. So speaking of that sweet spot, here's one. This is a Gen One Viper PST, and there are a lot of people out there who probably are not going to have a hard time imagining what this looks like because it's been around or it was around for quite a while. But what was the deal behind making the Gen One PST? Did that come before the Razer Gen One? It did. It did. Yes. And it came after the, you know, obviously the Viper 3 to 9 that we had previously mentioned. Now we're right. talking about a scope that's got tall turrets. It's got illuminated reticle, first focal plane. We're selling it to people who want to shoot stuff really far away, targets, you know, competition, stuff like that, long range precision guys. What what happened there? Paul, you want to start on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is kind of an interesting history on that. I think there we had a we had a good deal of foresight on that one. We really did. And it's funny, I don't remember a pivotal moment like I just described with the, the outdoor writer and the red dots and the AR-15s. But at some point, we really saw the handwriting on the wall about long-range shooting and dialing scopes. And, and we were, I think we really were ahead of our time on mm-hmm. that one. We, yeah. we had some people here that were very enthusiastic about that. Um, everybody kind of got on board with it and we came through and, uh, you know, we knew immediately some things that were very important off the get go that not everybody realized. And and one of the big ones in that series was we matched the turret adjustments to the reticle as far as both, either both were MOA or both were MRAD, where in the past, many other companies had, had mixed that up and they might have a, a mill dot based reticle, but they had MOA clicks on the turrets. And we saw that people were getting very interested in that. And, and as you as you learned about that type of shooting, it was really very important to have a reticle and turrets match. Right. And so we did that, but we spent a great deal of time, and, and Joe can touch him. We, went, we actually went through a couple revisions on that turret design. You probably yeah. remember that mm-hmm. well. I do. But we were very, very picky about how the turret felt yeah. as far as clicks and feel and dialing, where in the past, not many people were all that picky yeah. about that. And so we did a couple of things that really resonated well in that market, and the price point was right on those scopes, and they exploded too. Yeah, I think I think Paul's spot on, and we did. We had a lot of foresight. There, there were certainly some customers who would um, articulate what they wanted, but almost kind of in a um, in sort of a perfect world sense. God, you know, it'd be great if you had a matching turret and reticle, and first focal plane, and tall tactical turrets, and illumination. You know, but like under a thousand dollars, right? You know, kind of yeah. like you know, I'd love to have a Ferrari for fifty bucks, kind of a thing. Well, I think between Sam and Paul and a few other people in turning, like you know, I think that's worth finding a way to make happen. Yeah, and it circles back to what yeah. you said earlier about really listening to people. Right. And there, and there were people in that world that, that I can remember well sort of complained about no one listened to what they were really wanting. Right. And we did that. So, so so I think, you know, when but a couple other things that, that Paul had mentioned is one is how critical the turrets are. Mm-hmm. And getting those yeah. right is always a big deal for us. Um, and, 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 and it certainly was with this scope. But yeah, when we came out... Um, this was one where I think we were pretty sure it was going to do really well, um, because there was nothing else like it. You'll see, you'll see a lot of options now out there on the market where you see, you know, under a thousand dollars and you'll see the matching turret and reticle and you see the illumination and first focal plane yeah. and things of that nature. But at that time, under a thousand dollars, you weren't even close. Right. And right. so it was ba- basically almost kind of like, you know, you just like a bit like Bigfoot. You know, um, I mean, it was just kind of like, <laughs> we you, found it. Yeah, yeah, we found it and it's yeah. here, here it is. And so we were back ordered for, you know, for a long time because we, we just couldn't even get enough of yeah, those. We, well, we, we were, we were leased at a Chacho that winter. And so we knew, yeah. we knew people were excited about it and dealers were excited about yes. it. And, well, and part of that back order, and you talk about, you know, listening to your customers, if I recall correctly, we announced 
the Viper PST series. And then ultimately through feedback and, and kind of our own evaluation, we weren't satisfied with those clicks. We wanted them to be a little bit more firm, a little bit more audible, um, a little more, you know, tactile. Uh, and because of that delayed it, it delayed the product, which actually um, exacerbated the backwards. After uh, a fair <laughs> amount of time, that exasperated exasperated what Joe said. The back orders, <laughs> practicing my words, uh, and uh, yeah, Dude. actually, I, I had one gentleman offer uh, to come down to the office and and kick my ass unless we. <laughs> I remember that was it yeah. a chat show. Is. No, no, it was just uh, over. Oh, the, that was another one. It was over the yeah. phone at the office. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it was a different guy. Different guy. Jeez, Louise, I'm like the most passive person in the world. <laughs> um, why are you picking on this guy? Um, and uh, you know, us being uh, the customer focused uh, company that we are, I I, I told him that uh, you offered up. A good I, ass to I kick. Said, I said, well, I, I don't think it's going to get the optics here, but uh, if you want to come down to the office, I suppose we can take care we of your can, needs. We can, we can figure be, something out. It's going to be one of those things where we all locked. That's where you introduce the new guy. This is Mark. <laughs> yeah. How about it? Yeah. It's going to be one of those things where we all locked arms with Mark while he turned around yeah. and just basically wound up for a big, you know, yeah. you're not going to You're not going to get your PST, but you're going to feel yeah. a hell of a lot better. But yeah, that was a that was. But going back to that product, one thing that was also interesting was that we had we had continued to grow steadily through the two thousands, if you will. But when that product came out, a lot of people that had either maybe scoffed because we were still fairly new on the market, or maybe even a retailer that was like, you know, I'm not going to carry your stuff. I've got these other brands. That was one that really made ever sort of forced everybody to say. Oh wow! Yeah, and, and Either I, we got to our... carry these guys, or or I need to look into Vortex, or I or I need to own a Vortex. Yeah. So it turned a lot of people that I think had kind of either scoffed or just you said, "Hey, they're not legit." It sort of there was a tipping point. It was, yeah, and I, and I think that's the point. A lot of our big industry competitors, I yeah. think, realized that we were oh, right. we were a player, right? Yeah. Well, Definitely. that was a lineup too, where I think a lot of options was an asset. You know, that was a pretty deep. Quote, quotation mark tactical lineup where you had everything yeah. from a one to four by twenty four all the way on up to a six to twenty four yeah. by twenty four. Yeah. First focal plane, the first second focal second yeah. and options in there. Um, like you said, just kind of a perfect storm of features right. and quality, but coming in at a price that was within reach of you right. know a lot more folks than other options that were out there. Right. Yep. Yeah. That was that was cool. You get a one to four with tall turrets and even cap turrets too. And that was a, and they, they were cool looking scopes. They were. <laughs> And then yeah. there was the turrets were cool looking. Then there was the old sweetheart that I love dearly: the two and a half to ten by thirty-two first focal plane. Mm-mm-mm. Great that, scope. That, mm. that, Very you know, nice that scope. Was, it, yeah, it was a great. If you used it, it's kind of like an it's, eight eight by thirty-two binocular. It is. Yeah. It, if you use one, it's fantastic. Nobody buys them. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's one of the that's, that's true. That's one yeah. of the really tough things. But it's yeah. it's just wonderful to use. That's one of the really tough things. Yeah. Sometimes when you just gotta. They, you wish that you could tell everybody in the world, you, like that you will be happy with this scope if you buy it. Right. Like I tell people a lot of times, the PST Gen Two Five to Twenty Five is a great optic, but if you want more travel and arguably a little bit better optical system, I think you know, uh, which is saying something. Better low light transmission or low light performance, bigger field of view. Like get the three to fifteen. Like you don't need always yeah. twenty five power. Yeah. And they go, oh yeah, thanks for the advice. And they get to five twenty five. And you know what? A lot of them end up being happy with it, which is great. Right. But they'll, you, you, no matter how much you try, you can't always make people want something, even if you think it's better for them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. What? Uh, real quick, Joe. What was it like? And maybe at this point, we had enough uh, hunters and shooters in the office um, going through MOA and MRAD with people as we uh, jumped into the PSTs and things like that at the time? I think both internally and externally, it was an educational process. Oh, yeah. I think in a lot of cases, people didn't even know they had been using MOA for a long time. Right. I mean, in some, right. in some right. cases, they right. did, but, yeah. but in a lot of cases, they didn't. Or first focal plane, for that matter. So I think MRAD and MOA, those differences there, and I think first focal plane became like a big a big talking point. They did. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and of course... If first focal plane was new to somebody, in a lot of cases, then you had to explain what second focal plane was. Yeah, you know, right. Hey, that's what you've been using this whole time. So, um, yeah, and that's always that's always a little bit of a challenge because there's there's times where it's important, like where education really helps, and then there's times where someone's like, "Hey, I don't want to be educated. Just, I, I just I just want what I want. Just right? give me what I ask for. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's it's a feeling out process, whether it's on the phone with a customer or at a show or with a retailer. What do they What do they want? Yeah. Um, 
and it has just been late. You know, it seems as though lately you might have been in the middle on your opinion of guns. Hey, I think they're cool. I don't really have any need for one back in the day. But nowadays, you have to have a side, it seems. And if you don't, then pick one fast, you know? Yeah. And so you have all these people who I think before <clears throat> just didn't have so much of an interest in guns, but they weren't against them. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, a lot of talk lately about, oh, well, you know, people are threatening to take your guns away. And now you're forced to say, oh man, what side do I want to be on? And so you have a lot of people now choosing the side to be on, you know, I want to protect my second amendment rights. I want to get a firearm. I want to learn how to use it, understand how to protect myself, how to enjoy using it um, in a competition world or whatever. And so, yeah, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of with, with PSTs and things like that. We're going to talk about the, the Razor Gen 1 is our last one here. Uh, a lot of folks just having to learn how to use these and choose what they want and what they need and how to, you know, how to implement it, which is yeah, good. how to use them. Uh, yeah. But the Gen 1 Razor, we're going to end on this one. Yeah. It's the last yeah. one brought. The bad boy. This thing. That's Whoa. a good one to end on. It is. That is. Now, that, that set up the course for, you know what, and even the Gen 1 Razor, we still sell it. Yep. Yeah, we it's do. Still here it's still such here, an yeah. awesome optic. It's yeah. still around. We've been in the Gen 2 Razors now, which are a, a fairly well-known optic, I would say. And we've been in those for a couple of years, and the Gen 1 Razor is still around, still kicking. This was my first rifle scope, which makes it totally sound like I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth or something <laughs> like that. I bought it. It was a, it was a, one that got sent in somehow, and it was totally torn to shreds. Person needed an optic ASAP, so I remember we replaced the optic, even though this one was repairable. I went into the repair shop. I used to work in rifle scope repairs, too. And I saw that thing sitting there, and I was like, can that thing be rebuilt? And they're like, oh, yeah, like, we just, you know, we had to do this real quick for the customer and, like, get him back out there shooting again. He had a competition or whatever, but, like, that thing's just been sitting there. We could rebuild it, and we rebuilt it, and it was all beat to heck, but it worked really well because those guys in rifle scope repair can rebuild it pretty well and uh, or very well. I, I would argue even better than new. And ended up shooting a Vortex Extreme with it. Made a lot of people angry because I put it on a Ruger American that cost oh like three hundred bucks. <laughs> people, you know, everybody you was melted like, mine that put day. a seventeen hundred dollar <laughs> optic on a Ruger American. I was like, I just did. <laughs> I shot yeah. a competition with it. Anyway, nice. I digress. But what was the deal with this optic? What what possessed us to? We got the PST going. What would possess somebody to come out with an an even higher end optic at that point? Paul, what, yeah, you that, I mean that, that, that that was another. I you know I'd call it another one of those milestone products. Yeah, that was us, a, yeah. This is one that was you know it was a kind of a multi year project developing it, so it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a very calculated decision, but it was one where we decided we were going to push into that yeah. higher end rifle scope market into what right. what I would sort of call the premium mm -hmm. tactical rifle scopes. Mm -hmm. So going for stuff like better glass. Uh, you know, better adjustability, better turrets, everything sort of improved over what the PSTs yeah. were, more rugged, more tough. Um, Upgraded zero stop from the Viper zero PST. Zero stop, anyways, right. I was going to say a oh, great yeah, deal of RCR. work went into the turret. Yeah, that was that actually went through several evolutions of, of yeah, I'll design. Yeah, I'll tell a funny story about that after you're yeah, done. Yeah, but I mean, it was essentially, it, it was for us, it was game-changing in that we now leapt into a market that was dominated more by very high end brands like you know companies like Schmidt and Bender and Premier and Night Force and, right. and it, well, it was a place we, we hadn't played in there before. So yeah. it was new for us. This thing had a yeah. thirty five mil tube. I mean mm -hmm. it's practically Some has very like, unique features. Like yeah. a four yeah. bedroom home to for the erector unit to walk around. It had it. the unique color, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, come in that's black. Exactly. That was, yeah. You can talk about some yeah. controversy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that thing not coming in black. I tell you what, if we ever make a rate well, we made the Razor AMG in black. Yeah. But if we ever do another Razor in black, I'm gonna throw a hissy yeah. fit. I so, love Stealth Shadow. <laughs> but so Paul's right. That was a huge catalyst for our company. So one, I mean, it, it was great because it, it did sell well. It was obviously a really high quality product. But I think kind of not only getting our mindset around what our capabilities of what we could do was, mm -hmm. and also a lot of the technology and a lot of the 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 uh, features that we put into that, then carrying those over throughout other other products that we did beyond that. But then also changing the customers and the retailers 
others' minds as well, and probably some of our yeah. competitors, I would imagine, as to the capabilities that 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 we had as a company. Um, so it was really a game changer and a catalyst for our company and, and a milestone. I have a f- couple funny stories. Uh, one was, um, so Paul's right, there's definitely several different iterations of the turret, and one of the big aspects was how... Um, how intuitive can we make the zero stop? And so I remember distinctly at least <laughs> two, maybe three different times where they came out and they said, "Hey, Joe, can you come back here?" Uh, and then they're, they're, I'd, I'd walk back, and, the, and then and then they'd say, um, "I want you to see if you can just figure out how to do that zero stop." <laughs> yep. So no directions. I, I, you know, what I learned very quickly is I was the litmus test for, uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, is this thing idiot proof or not? Basically, if I could man. figure it out and and right. So there was the, I. I'll never forget the first one. I could not figure it out, and Paul and Sam just looking at each other, not saying anything, <laughs> didn't want to embarrass me. Just a long pause, and I think a, mm, you know, and then and yep. then sure, a couple months later, I came back and the zero stop. Would be completely <laughs> different, you know. And what so, what happened to the old one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry yeah, about yeah, that, yeah. So, it, so it was. Uh, we we did. Uh, we, there was a lot of things like that that we yeah, did. You, you steered us right on that one. Yeah, those yeah, those yeah, first yeah. ones were pretty bad. There were. Little, yeah. I remember little screws and yeah. pieces you could yeah. drop in there, and it was. Yeah. Like, no, I was no engineering not help not. whatsoever, but I could I could tell them that I wasn't it, the common man wasn't going to be able to. And, figure and, and out. an excellent <laughs> test platform. Now I remember that time frame as well, and I you know they must have been doing uh, isolated uh, experiments. <laughs> Experiments on uh, we could combine like our IQs observations. <laughs> <laughs> It's a direct addition. <laughs> they, they couldn't have it. There'd be too much power. Joe. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's, um, I'll, I'll, that's how I like to look at but it. They were, I, they were worried you guys would just together come up with a better zero stop right there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah. I remember Sam's like, yeah, same story. Hey, you know, can you do this? You know, and I think actually I had the benefit of he gave me a you rundown. Got, you got the He was like, okay, this first, is what you need so. to do. And I believe there was you know a wrench involved and screws. And I remember the first thing I did. Was I I dropped I I dropped the wrench and I lost it <laughs> right and I think right. I, like it was, I hear clink 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 yeah. I'm like well maybe this isn't the best one for the field <laughs> yeah because I just I just lost some of the parts yeah. in the building oh that's but, great but there was a couple of things with that and 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 was uh with that product is we really wanted to we wanted to feel confident that we thought that was the best rifle scope on the planet and we wanted and we wanted to be bold with a few things and one of them was we wanted we had the largest uh um, at that time. Um, uh, you know, turret travel, travel uh, range, uh, travel scope, range yeah, and turret yeah, at 35 millimeters yeah. and most travel within the scope. And then that was another reason that we wanted to do the stealth shadows. We wanted that to stand out. And I think there was a little bit of that, and we still have it today, and I hope we never lose it. A little bit of that underdog mentality and a little bit of kind of like, you know, we sort of felt like a lot of people thought, you know, you don't belong, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can do kind of some of these, you know, two, $300 rifle scopes and stuff like that, but don't, 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 don't get too big for your britches. And then we could have the PST and then, and so there was a little bit of that where we just thought, Hey, just watch us, watch what we're going to do with that gen one. And I think as much as that, that impacted, you know, external perceptions of us, I think it also gave us a lot of confidence, you know, when we came out with that and it kind of just fueled our fire to continue to be bold, um, with the products that we come out with and the features and the benefits and, and also to, to continue to, to kind of dream, dream big as to far as to, as to what we could do. So it, 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 Paul's really right. That was a big milestone, not only from a, from a physical standpoint, but I think a psychological standpoint as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, it is funny too, because now stealth shadow is becoming required in some arenas because of its lack of reflect black uh, lack of reflectivity <laughs> yeah. or whatever black yeah, yeah. isn't actually yeah. more reflective or something like that yeah. um yeah a little different than henry ford was you can have any any color you want as long as it's in black in this case it was you can have any razor right. you yeah. want yeah. as long as it's in stealth shadow and can we uh quick also explain how difficult it is to explain stealth shadow as well because i have heard silver i've heard oh, okay. brown bronze, bronze yeah. gray i've heard uh uh, flat. I've heard tan. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a it's compilation weird. of all that. It's, I've got to say, bronze might be the closest, but I it's not so, quite yeah. right yeah, either, no, right? A, if you think a penny is bronze, then yeah. that's it's not yeah, bronze. It's not a penny, right. yeah. but it's it's uh it it's a it, I don't know. I've always yeah. I've always liked it. I have too. Um, I, I think mm. that was a that was a good decision at the time, and many people have questioned that over the right. years. But I I think it was a good decision, and I I yeah. suspect that really contributed to the sales yeah. numbers. I having yeah. a very yeah. unique 
look to it. Well, it made and it I, obvious when you were at, if you're at a competition or you saw a bunch of people shooting down the line. Yep. And yeah. you just looked down there, you knew which one was a razor. Razor, yeah. razor. Yeah. You know, yeah. because yeah. It, it, if anybody who's gone into a store or whatever, you see these the rifle scopes, and they do tend to all just it's, look the same. Yeah. It's just these sea of black tubes, and so that was one thing we we thought it, the product deserved something yeah. to stand out. No two stealth shadows are alike. Sam told me that one time. I didn't know that. By the nature of the anodizing process to get that stealth shadow, that no two of them are exactly alike. And uh, you, you can see it. If you look at them all in a, in a big line and sure. you just really get close, sometimes there will be extremes, but even amongst different optics, there will be subtle variations in the in the hue. It's interesting, though. The color itself is like that, though. It's like kind of like we're talking about this, right. this compilation yeah. of so many different earth tones, that, it, and it actually changes... Ver- in, in yeah. varying light conditions. Light, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say Much better ir- than those typhoons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> school, yeah. School Although you can tell no, what you're looking at. <laughs> no one's ever called it mud brown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no one's ever called it mud brown. <laughs> oh, man. If we keep talking about colors too much, we're going to start sounding like, you know, we're headed to the nail salon to get still shadow nails or something. Hey, that would be pretty cool. If anybody's got still shadow nails, send that yeah. in. We'll <laughs> pop that up on Instagram. You know what? Good point. Um, well, yeah. What do you say we dive into the last calls here? Real quick, I'll start, even though I don't know what I'm going to say. Just It just occurred to me, but MC Ryan was flashing an hour at me a little bit ago. So, um, I, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, for those of you who kind of were curious about where Vortex, kind of some of the some of the places it's come from, how the brand has evolved, I think, I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but to a lot of people it might seem as though, oh, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, around 2010 there was this brand called Vortex, and they had a bunch of different stuff, and they, you know, they had a big social media thing, and, they were there. Yep. Um, that might it might seem that way, and maybe understandably so because you weren't following us when you know we had compasses in our binoculars and they were school bus <laughs> yellow. But it um, just hit true north. <laughs> yep, yep, there we go. Uh, An hour in, <laughs> we got her. So anyway, yeah, like we said, hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of a a peek back at some of the history. We were calling this almost like a museum tour of vortex over the years. Uh, but if you want to hear any more stuff like this or if this piqued your interest, definitely let us know. Hit us up on Instagram. We post about this at Vortex Nation Podcast. So that's uh, that's my last call. And man, uh, I'd just say it's uh, been a really fun trip down memory lane. Like we said, you know, yeah. I've been fortunate enough to be here through the evolution of a lot of these products and through uh, a lot of the evolution of Vortex. Not not as long as, as Paul and Joe, but um, it's just been uh, been pretty cool to see how this stuff has evolved and i mean how how fast it's been it's been pretty yeah. pretty astonishing that's for sure so and if you've been relying on the compass in your twister binocular <laughs> uh i hope you get out of the woods soon <laughs> <laughs> stop yeah. wasting battery power to listen right. to this podcast right. and call, right. Right. call someone uh paul yeah no I, I mean i could agree with mark it's it's been a fun sort of trip down memory lane going over these things brings back a lot of memories for mm-hmm. sure um it is you know it's it's pretty neat though i look at these products and i think and i you know and i know some stuff that's coming in the pipeline for us that i can't share the the details on yet but you know i think we're still keeping down that same track of, of having some really nice exciting products still watching what people are looking for and um you know we plan to be there for a long time to come this is only the beginning of the iceberg so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, first, last call. Yeah. Other than everything everybody else said, I would say that just keep, um, keep giving us feedback, you know, whether that be social media, whether that be email or on the phone, um, it may not seem like it's doing much at that given point, but to Paul's point, it takes us a while, you know, products take some time to, to come out and that feedback, um, you know, it, it matters, and we do use it. And so, uh, please just keep keep giving us that feedback. The more feedback that we have from from customers, the better idea we have on what products we should put together to to obviously um, you know have available for you guys. Yeah, that's a great that's, that's, that's a great call. that's a really good one. Nailed it. Well, I think that'll do it for this one. We're gonna sign off again. Like I said, if you want to hear any more of this stuff, definitely let us know. Uh, and uh, any other topics too, we're always happy to hear it. I think that'll do it. Let's end it on the classic bye. Bye. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. That's a new thing. Double thumbs. Thumbs Double thumbs. All right. (laughs) Bye.